So it's Monday, August the 3rd, 2020. And I'm here in Toledo, Ohio, just near the National Museum of the Great Lakes. Not really sure what to expect from this, but the moniker of National Museum that should make it the preeminent museum of its type. Um, but it doesn't look like it's that big, so we'll see. That was uh, Interstate 280, by the way, that, that bridge that was in the view um, was associated with that. In 300 feet, arrive at 1701 Front Street on the right. National Museum of the Great Lakes, Toledo Skyway Marina, 1701 Front Street. Well, let's see, I guess we're supposed to go in this way. i got to figure out what that bridge is. I didn't take note of it before, even though I came over it yesterday afternoon. Yeah, fairly small museum building, but they've got a, an ore boat out here. So that should be interesting. It looks like you can go on it, hopefully. So the big boat that's here is the Colonel James M. Schoonmaker. And there's the uh, tugboat which I think is part of this. And the museum building. Boy, the sun is hot. After a couple of days of it being pretty cool and cloudy in the Detroit area, this morning the thing's just like a, a ray gun. Whatever side is facing me is just baking. So even though this area over here looks kind of weedy from a distance, it's actually kind of a park atmosphere. Uh, with the museum building there and the Schoonmaker museum ship there and then this park there's a, uh, a watershed viewpoint stack emblems steering wheel radio direction finder display of anchors a capstan some propellers so a few other things to see in that immediate area I don't see anything saying what this is from. Well, according to uh, According to this sign, the large bronze propeller is um, from the John Sherwin, built in Toledo in 1958. Apparently it was the single propeller on the ship. This one here is not identified. This is obviously not a cast-in-one-piece propeller. Yeah. It's 
10 o'clock in the morning and the museum has just opened. So uh, I was thinking to myself that this boat is probably not pronounced, the name of it is probably not pronounced Schoonmaker, and they confirmed inside that it was Schoonmaker. And this is the uh, Tugboat Ohio, we'll go on that later, and then the Schoonmaker. It's a big boat, although I think they came a lot bigger. The SS Colonel James M. Schoonmaker, when she was launched in 1911, she became the new Queen of the Lakes, the longest ship on the lakes at 617 feet. What distinguished her was her width of 64 feet, designed to fit the Sioux locks. She sailed the lakes for 70 years, the last 11 of them as the Willis, Willis B. Boyer. The Schoonmaker was saved from scrapping through a 25-year campaign to raise the funds needed to restore her as a museum ship. There's a uh, picture of her labeled as the Willis B. Boyer. So going aboard the Schoonmaker. Start the tour. Okay, this is a example of the cargo holds here, cargo hold covers. And they have a rail here for running that little crane, traveling crane that is. And by the way, this uh, body of water here that we're on, I was thinking it was a ship channel, but I also knew the Maumee River was around here, and it turns out this is the Maumee River. And uh, after it passes under the aforementioned bridge, then it goes into Maumee Bay. The only other time I recall seeing the Maumee River, it was much smaller than this obviously further upstream. They have this whole arrow guided tour here. Enter to view cargo hold.
I'm using my better camera for this because it does so much better in low light with the larger optics and better sensor. I hope that the audio is working because the microphones got really wet yesterday. I'll be disturbed if I find out that this sounds awful. I think this platform run is not original. I think this is something they cut in here so it could be accessed by tourists. The uh, hatch and walkway over on that side I think is probably more representative of how this would have been done. You could go down to an observation platform and then down another flight of stairs to that uh, flat ridge there and walk along there and there's openings where a man could fit through there through the structural members This is how these ships were typically loaded. They pull up next to a pier with uh, loaded rail cars along the top and then the uh, cars would dump through the bottoms of the cars down through the tracks and onto chutes which could be individually lowered to line up with the cargo hold hatches and they would fill it up that way which is loading used using gravity. My uh, parents came from Superior, Wisconsin and when I used to go up there as a kid they had a lot of these um, big piers for uh, loading the ore boats. I think they were mostly dealing with taconite there for uh, steel making. Then for unloading they would uh, pull up to a a dock or a pier of some sort and they had these uh, unloaders that would lower into each uh, cargo bay and um, then trains would pull up there and you could see them in that picture. When the bucket couldn't reach any more, cargo would push a smaller bulldozer into the hold. It would lower a small bulldozer into the hold to get the last bit of cargo out. We're in cargo hold number two. This is the center hold of the ship's three cargo holds. Each holds 5,000 tons and is 150 feet in length, 64 feet wide, and 27 feet in depth. The bottom of the hole is called the inner bottom. There are six feet of framing below it, which attaches to the outer bottom shell plating. Okay. What's not clear to me is how they got these hatch covers off. They don't just slide off, it looks like. They've got clasps all the way around. So maybe they had to be lifted off by a crane. Maybe that's what this is for. <laughs> yeah, telescoping hatch covers had to be winched open and closed, then tarped to make them watertight. This process was slow and took many men. The one-piece hatch cover system was much more efficient. When, 
when Schoonmaker was originally launched with 35 telescoping hatches, she was reconfigured later on in 1942 to employ this six and a half ton Northern Engineering Works hatch crane and now has 18 hatches. Yeah, the docent outside the boat was joking that he's sitting out there in a tent and he can't hardly get any shade from the low angle of the sun and it is just baking. Whatever side of you it hits, feels like somebody has a blowtorch on. And he was joking that he used to be in Seattle where the three days a year when the sun comes out, everybody drops to their knees and wails to the gods. You know, what did we do to offend you? How have we blasphemed? <laughs> okay, so we're in the rear superstructure. This is the first engineer's bunk accessible directly to the outside instead of to the inside. Still a pretty reasonable cabin. Stowage under the bunk. Stowage above the bunk. Little shelf. Reading light. Desk. Dresser. Mirror. And a private bathroom back there. And the oiler wiper cabin is typical of a crewman's non-officer cabin. Because of their duties in the engine room, berthing for engine crew was aft, back of the ship, while the deck crew slept forward in the ship's foxhole. Originally, four men would have occupied this cabin. Note the four lockers, but only two bunks. As two men were on duty, two were off duty. At the change of the watch, the off-going crew member would crawl into a warm bunk. His counterpart had just left and effectively complete a process known as hot bunking. Wonder if they bothered changing the sheets. But at least they have their own bathroom to share amongst four people. It's not too awful. I think the crews on these are pretty small compared to, for example, a Navy ship. This is the um, <clears throat> the mess here. That's an interesting table design. Looks like whoever was serving could come into the middle. This would be, let's see, is this the officer's dining room? <clears throat> Which has remained almost entirely intact, minus a skylight since 1911. The paneling you see before you is fumed oak, referring to the method of staining in which the fumes from ammonia were used to give the raw oak its color. The dining table is the original one from the ship. Captain would sit at the head end of the table, adjacent to the inside bulkhead, while the chief would sit at the other end and thus demonstrating the strong rivalry between the deck and engine departments aboard the ship. In order to enter this room while underway, a crew member needed the express consent of the captain or the chief engineer and must be in uniform. Other crew members permitted to eat in this room were the mates, assistant engineers, and occasionally wheelmen or wheelsmen.
like kind of a canal spillway or whatever those are called. I didn't finish walking around up here before I go down to the engine room. And what's this? I don't see a sign, but it it's a private room, so it's some sort of officer's room, I guess. Yeah, it doesn't have any signage. Oh, I'm sorry, it does over here. Missed it. This is the chief steward's cabin. As the head cook on board, the steward was ultimately responsible for all meal planning and preparation was assisted by the second cook and porter. At one time, this room was part of the owner's and guest's dining room. Notice the ornate ceiling, which was once accompanied by the fumed oak walls and lavish cupboards. Okay, we're gonna go back this way. I think we were supposed to go down to the engine room earlier. I just walked through a spider whip there. I may be the first person down here today. <clears throat> this looks like it's the um, it's a steam driven steering engine and the large black gear is responsible for turning the rudder which steers the ship. The helmsman steered the ship by turning the ship's wheels, which are located in the pilot house at the other end or bow of the ship 600 feet away. If you look toward the overhead above, you will see two steering linkages, one painted yellow, one painted red. There's a red one. There's a yellow one. Coupled together. The red linkage runs along the left or port side of the ship and the yellow runs along the right or starboard side. In case of damage to one steering linkage, they could switch to the other. Upon turning the steering wheels, the steam power from the steering engine is applied to the black steering gear, which is attached directly to the yellow rudder post. The rudder on the Schoonmaker is approximately 24 feet tall and 12 feet wide. This is the engine room here. Steam driven turbines and then electric motors. And um, you can see the main drive shaft way down there maybe through the grating. There it is running aft to the propellers. And this is the reversing turbine here for a stern operation. It's mounted on 
the forward end of the shaft of the low pressure turbine and can be operated by steam pressure. Then you have the turbine reduction gear, the high pressure turbine, low pressure turbine, controls, engineering, I suppose engineer's station down there, kind of a desk. This is the water purification system and the diesel electric generator. This is the engine order telegraph or Chadburn relaying the uh, engine orders from the pilot house back here and then the actual driving would be from this console. Various gauges, enunciators, controls. And this appears to be a boiler here. At least it has the looks of a boiler. Yeah. D type boiler. Two drum bent tube accelerated circulation two pass boiler. Powered by Westinghouse. Here's the uh, drive shaft again, but we can't go down there, it looks like, well maybe we can, if we keep going around. Since we're way back here in the um, stern of the ship, you can see the walls curving in. It gets very tight back here very quickly. Yeah, it looks like they may have let people go down there before, but they're not at this time. Okay, so let's see, I want to make sure I'm not missing something here. I'm going to have to go back this way again. 
somewhere I deviated from the proper path. Okay, we already looked in here. Already looked in here. We can't go that way. Okay, so <laughs> we're just getting back to where we were. Just wanted to make sure. Okay. So, at least we have arrows going in the right direction now. And then it meets arrows coming this way with no further guidance. Ah, uh, here we go. Huh. Trying to figure out how they got this ship here. Since the uh, old interstate bridge, which is the low one there, before they built the tall one, does not appear to have clearance under it, but maybe that middle section, that may be a drawbridge. It kind of looks like one. That's probably how it was done. This is nice. Uh, I've been on a lot of ship museums or museum ships, but pretty sure I've never been on an ore boat before. Guess we'll go up there eventually. Second mate's quarters. With his own tiled bathroom. Somebody else's quarters and a nicer bathroom. Okay, where's the sign saying who is this is? Hmm, don't see one. Somebody else's quarters of a higher rank.
Hmm. Sort of unspecific, but you don't get a quarters like that by yourself unless you have a higher rank, I think. Obviously way up at the the bow now. Everything's angling forward rather severely. And these look like they keep going, but it's just a mirror. In the galley, work of another kind is in progress. Hmm. Our important well I'll study sailor. The elegant room here is the grill room. This space remains intact in its entirety, minus the second large table from 1911, and includes fumed oak paneling, tile flooring, coffered ceiling, skylight, and electric fireplace grill. The room was used strictly as a passenger lounge and relaxation area. The ship's original owner, William P. Snyder, advocated traveling aboard his vessels to get a first look at how his operation was run. When he did so, he would bring corporate guests and close friends, such as Colonel James N. Schoonmaker and Andrew Carnegie. Towards the end of the Schoonmaker's career, this space was used as a cruise lounge and venue for 24-hour poker games. Okay. So we have to go back this way and up the stairs. So these uh, weren't actually then cruise quarters. These were for guests. That explains why they're so nice. A friend of mine told me that when she was young, she took a cruise on a uh, or boat somewhere in the Great Lakes. I don't recall the reason she gave for it. So this is the captain or owner's lounge. This room was used by the captain and owner for relaxation and entertaining invited guests. This portrait here, which is blotted out by the lights is uh, of the vessel's namesake Civil War Medal of Honor recipient and railroad industry innovator James Martin Schoonmaker looks like a pretty nice place to hang out This is the owner's stateroom that we're in. This room was typically occupied by the vessel's owner or highest ranking executive aboard any given ship. This room was occupied numerous times by William P. Snyder, Colonel James M. Schoonmaker, Andrew Carnegie, Willis B. Boyer. Enter the bathroom and you'll notice a luxurious shower constructed of slab marble paneling. Boy, it's like a throne. Gotta do something about that sink though. This looks nice. The captain's office that we're in was used by the ship's master to conduct the ship's daily administrative duties which included position reporting, trip planning, and bookkeeping. 
of particular note in this space are the captain's gyro repeater, key locker, safe, icebox, bookcases, and fold-down chart table. Also notice the private small stairwell heading up to the observation lounge. That's pretty nice actually. And you could get a good view ahead from here if you didn't mind looking through the staircase. The, uh, all the deck slopes on this ship for water runoff, presumably. So even here in this part of it, the floor slopes to my left. You have to kind of stand a little crooked. This is the captain's cabin we're in. One of the finest spaces aboard the ship as it offered an exceptional deck view in addition to its luxury. The velvet curtains and cushions were in this and every other officer's stateroom. Also note the captain's unique dresser. If you were to place this on your floor at home it would lean to one side. Each piece of furniture or woodwork aboard the vessel was custom crafted to the exact camber side to side curvature of the ship of the slopes uh, of the slope of the ship. You can kind of see that there. It's subtle, but it's still there. I don't think you want to pull any of those Titanic stunts at the bow here. There's nothing much to hold on to. This is the observation room on the Texas deck. This room was designed to resemble the round room at the forward end of Mississippi River steamers, which were called Texas rooms. This space was strictly for passenger relaxation and offered a 360 degree view. The schoonmaker and her sister ship, the William P. Snyder Jr., were the only two ships in Great Lakes history to have such a room. And this is the top end of that private staircase down into the captain's cabin. Thank you. 
nice view up here. So this is the pilot house. It was manned by a navigational officer and a wheelsman, or wheelsman, as well as the captain at any given time. Upon her launching, this vessel was the platform for many industry firsts, which included being the first Great Lakes vessel to have wireless telegraph, dual steering system, or du dual steering gear systems, a general s alarm system, an intership communications telephone system, and an engine direction indicator. The schoonmaker and her sister ship, William P. Snyder Jr., were the only two Great Lakes vessels ever to employ two steering wheels in the pilot house. The wheel on the starboard, or right side, was primarily used, and the other was an auxiliary. Notice the large brass binnacle which houses the ship's magnetic compass. Although this is not the ship's original binnacle, it was put on late in the vessel's career and was made by, by the Lionel Corporation, most commonly known for making toy trains. This is the radio direction finder here. Presumably you would turn this wheel and listen through the headphones. And this is the uh, obviously, well, maybe obviously, it looks like a slightly later edition, the uh, radar. Um, <clears throat> since this vessel was from, what, 1911? I don't seem to recall they had radar in 1911, so I think this was added a bit later. Um, so, radar screen. This is a Sperry Mark 16 radar, and this is another one, so looks like they had two of them. wireless. This is your uh, engine remote control or engine telegraph. guessing maybe this is the ship's horn. Kind of has that look. Or maybe it's that.
All right, let's go out this side. <clears throat> hmm. I suppose the captain occupied one of these. This is the high chair. That looks more comfortable, sort of. But this one's padded. Not sure. I'm trying to follow the arrows even though it's not strictly necessary. <clears throat> they have the uh, please use handrail sign at both ends so there's no clue there but again it's really kind of free form in spite of all the arrows leading you in a particular path around the ship. And I'm going against the arrows again. Oops. That is a ginormous spider web on it that I don't want to walk through. Jeez. Hi. Okay, we've done everything on this level. So we go back down here now. And then we exit the ship over here. Well, this is well worth it. Really glad I came out here to see this. Now I've used up one hour of the two hours I allocated to be in this museum. So I have to go down to the tugboat and see that. And then go inside the museum. And that should probably work out about right. I also want to go over and look at a couple of these things in the garden. Okay, let's go out into the park. This is a capstan for dropping and raising the anchor on a large ship. Uh, this is not from this ship, it's just a capstan from 1898. Maida, built by the American Steel Barge Company, West Superior, Wisconsin. American Ship Windlass Company, Providence, Rhode Island. Huh. Two names on the same item. And it's pretty nice here too, even though the sun's beating down, it's got a nice breeze from being right on the edge of the lake. There's, uh, what, three anchors here? As it says here, the first anchors were large rocks tied to ropes and dropped to the sea bottom. Later came iron hooks. Eventually, anchors took on the familiar shape known today. Two flukes, 
at the end of a shank that is topped by a stock set perpendicular to the flukes. When the anchor is dropped, the stock catches on the bed and turns the anchor until one of the flukes digs in. But Admiralty anchors can pull free unexpectedly and are difficult to raise and store. Today, most ships have stockless anchors. Developed in the 19th century, these anchors have a series of projections on the shank that drag on the bottom, causing the flukes to dig in. That's the auxiliary gangway there that goes into the uh, <coughs> cargo compartment we were in before. And this is just a sign of stack emblems here. It's not actual stack emblems. It says how experienced ship spotters can tell the difference between seemingly identical ships just at a glance. How? Every shipping line uses, uses unique hull colors, fleet flags, and markings on their smokestacks to identify their boats. In the year 1900, 3,000 boats owned by hundreds of shipping companies plied the Great Lakes. Although many of these fleets are now gone, cur current boat owners continue this practice. Like any corporate branding effort, the identifying markings often change over time. These stack emblems shown here came from Columbia Steamship Company boats, which were owned by Ogle Bay Norton, representing the brand from the 1950s to the 1990s. This is a dual steering wheel. Ship's direction is controlled by a rudder turning the rudder and thus the ship requires turning the ship's wheel. The wheel and rudder are connected by a vertical shaft called the rudder post. When the ship's wheel is turned, it rotates a gear that turns the rudder post, which turns the rudder. In the late 19th century, shipbuilders began installing emergency ship wheels at the stern of the boat to be used in the event that the boat's wheel system located in the pilot house at the bow or front end of the boat would fail. These emergency wheels were often dual steering wheels, which made it easier for two people to turn the wheel unassisted by onboard powered machinery. The dual steering wheel shown here is from the Frank E. Taplin, which was scrapped in the late 1960s. It's a nice setting here. Even though it's generally pretty uh, industrial right around here, they've done a nice job in this immediate area. Prettying it up, making it more than just a boat tied along the pier or the dock or whatever. This isn't even really a dock. They have a sign there talking a little bit about submarines of the Great Lakes. This is the top of a radio direction finder. For millennia, ships out of sight of land navigated by using the position of the sun, moon, and stars. The discovery of radio waves changed navigation forever. By the late 1920s, ships used special antennas called radio direction finders, or RDF, to determine the source of radio navigation transmissions on land. By measuring the strength and thus the distance from various transmitters, a navigator could triangulate the ship's relative location. RDF remained the primary means of navigation until the global positioning system, or GPS, gained wide use. The last RDF transmissions in the U.S. and Canada ended in the year 2010.
so this is the uh, Ohio tugboat <coughs> so Ooh, it's hot in here. Chart table. Pilot house, engine room, engineer's room, intercom. I think this is probably radar. I don't see that it says anywhere, but I think that's what it is. Ship's telegraph, I think. Stop, astern. If we go far, yeah, ahead is up there. Sperry. Um, Avro compass. It's kind of rubbed out. So it's a compass. And then ahead in the stern, PSI gauges. And a pointer, which may indicate the position of the rudder. And then a uh, probably a gyro compass, probably engine alarm, rudder angle, a more modern navigation system, radios. Wonder what they did for ventilation in here. I, the only thing I could see that would ventilate this place is up here. Maybe they had a couple vents. Well, no, it looks more like the paneling just came down. And it doesn't... Oh, I bet, yeah, these slid down so you could open the side windows. Otherwise it would get stifling in here. Well, this is kind of decrepit mess here. <laughs> I suppose this is the captain's quarters. Bathroom, bed, desk. lift your legs high to get in there and obviously the galley and uh, apparently the mess at the same time in the same place pretty small crew on these I suppose just a handful of people and there's a looks like a shower and a sink there and a toilet, I think, around there, yep. So that's probably the, other than the captain, probably everybody had to use those facilities. And then there's something down there we can't go to. <clears throat> oh, nope. There's another uh, full bathroom arrangement here for somebody to use and then various storerooms and stuff ship's engine down here
can't really get a better look at that than that. It's uh, this needs a lot more fixing up. <clears throat> Some sort of an office back there. Maybe that's the engineer's room. I think he'd probably be the second in command on a small boat. That's about it. A lot less to see on the tugboat. It only takes about five or ten minutes. So now we'll go inside the museum building for the remaining half hour. Together, the Great Lakes are the Earth's largest group of freshwater lakes holding 21% of the world's fresh water and 84% of North America's. Each lake is a distinct body with its own biological characteristics, connected by a natural and man-made waterway or waterways. I keep forgetting to mention that the river we're on here, the Maumee River, empties into Maumee Bay, which is at the far west end of Lake Erie. There's sort of a uh, topographic view of Lake Michigan showing the depths. Looks like the deepest is about 924 feet up there. Lake Michigan, unlike all the rest of the lakes, is positioned along a north-south axis. This fact, coupled with its proximity to traditional jet stream activity, makes Lake Michigan the most dangerous and deadly of the lakes, at least in sheer numbers. Out of the estimated 8,000 shipwrecks on the Great Lakes, nearly 35% rest in the deep waters of Lake Michigan. The north-south orientation leaves little room for a boat to run when storms arrive in the west and travel to the east. And there's a uh, topographic map of Lake Huron, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie. Much shallower. Looks like the maximum depth here is only about 216 feet. Lake Huron gets up to 750 feet. Lake Ontario, about 660 feet. The last lake to be discovered. Lake Erie is the most contentious. It was the last of the Great Lakes discovered by Europeans, and it has been the most contested. As the first lake above Niagara Falls, it was strategically important to controlling access to the rest of the Great Lakes. The site of many battles, the new independent Ameri American nation finally took control in 1813. And then Lake Superior, which I always understood was the deepest lake, but maybe not. Let's see, it's showing, no, 1,332 feet at one point.
the iron that built a nation was mined around and shipped across Lake Superior. Minerals like copper and iron ore were essential ingredients in the formation of a modern industrial economy. Their widespread availability in the Lake Superior region and their cost-effective transportation to urban centers encouraged businessmen to risk everything in the hopes of financial success. And then we get to Lake Ontario here. Via the St. Lawrence Seaway, Lake Ontario is the region's gateway to the world. And Lake Huron, remote and beautiful Lake Huron was the first to be discovered by Europeans. But it has not experienced the heavy industrial development, so it's more pristine, according to this. And we have some ship models. Um, that one in the back is the Northland, and that's the R.N. Rice, the Argo, the Meridia, the James R. Barker, the uh, a Voyager Canoe, the W.S. Crossthwaite and um, the Tom M. Girdler and then the little schooner over there is the Challenge. Construction and materials. Collection of artifacts. Little working models of steam engines. gas can, running front, running light fount, and an oil can from the wreck of the Tug Admiral in 1942. Fore and aft loading lights, ledgers, signs, builder's plates, ship's clock, dry compass, Sextant. It's supposed to be a radar. Various navigational tools. Polaris. Gyro compass and repeater. Ship's whistle, radio tubes, flares, hand powered whistle, ship's bell, ship to shore phone, megaphone, fog horn, ship lanterns, brief description of Morse code, display of life saving equipment.
survival suit from the Wilfred Sykes in the 18, 1980s. After the loss of the Edmund Fitzgerald in 1975, the Coast Guard was required, the Coast Guard required survival suits such as this one in the end of a mariner was in the water for an extended period of time. Finding survivors in the golden day. Unless they are in extremely cold waters, many accident survivors can be saved if found within 24 hours. What rescuers call the golden day. I think I said bay before. Rescuers follow signals from emergency position indicating radio beacons, flare gun, oil lamp, emergency position indicating radio beacons. A lot of nice artifacts in here. Wish I had a little more time. But I have an appointment at another museum that's appointment only. And since they told me on the phone when I called that two hours would be more than enough to see everything here, that's all I allocated. Some lighthouse Fresnel lenses. Second order Fresnel lens. Bit of talk about lighthouse keepers. like a lifeboat. This has all the equipment on it necessary to rescue shipwreck survivors close to shore. This is the ship's stories area. Based on my experience here, I would recommend three hours to see this whole place, not two hours. Two hours if you just want to see the boats, but if you want to come through the museum and look at everything and read everything, you should give it an extra hour, I would say. about wraps up it. And 
there's a small gift shop there. So definitely a good visit. I'd never heard of this place before, but definitely worthwhile stopping in if you're anywhere near the Toledo area. It's quick access off the interstate, real easy to get to, nice facility, interesting stuff. And there probably is nothing like it anywhere else, so stop by. This is the bridge that takes US Highway 65 across the Maumee River. I don't know the name of the bridge at this point. I'll have to look it up. I'm just driving along First Street along the Maumee River here in Toledo. Trying to get on the appropriate interstate to head south towards Dayton. And I've just come from the National Museum of the Great Lakes. see a very industrial part of Toledo. Huge grain silos right along the river. 